Check this out. Two separate spools feeding two separate extruders pushing two separate filaments into this hot end with a single nozzle. This is the A20M from GTEC, and today we'll talk about it as we print, assemble, and demo the 6th order series tune bandpass subwoofer. Alright, let's make this interesting, and I can't think of a more entertaining way to put a 3D printer through its paces than to bring you along as I conjure up a massive project. A trial by fire build with parts large enough to print for days on end, testing the limits of the build volume sucking up multiple spools of filament, altogether ensuring that there's simply no going back to adjust and try again. GTEC sent this along with some filament, which I'm already quite happy with. In fact, if you recall the Hexilamp project, that's GTEC brand PLA used for the base and for the top cover. The printer itself is a Cartesian style FDM unit with a build volume of 255 millimeters on all three axes, so basically a 10 inch cube. And it comes almost fully assembled, save for the gantry, which mounts to the base with a set of four screws. There's also a pair of Bowden extruders that attach to the back of the frame, along with some filament detectors to let the printer know when you've ran out of material. And everything wires up with these harnesses, which I especially like since it makes the kit easy to assemble, disassemble, and service. Speaking from a purely hands-on perspective, GTEC has done a commendable job at the manufacturing level. Everything feels solid, the gantry feels rigid, even when it's not attached to the frame, the hot-end carriage has a firm grip on the x-axis rail, and the rail itself has an equally firm hold on the gantry. Really, my only annoyance at this stage would have to be the poorly illustrated assembly guide that would occasionally leave me staring at the page trying to make heads and tails of what I'm seeing. Of course, now that I've actually put it together, doing it again would probably only take about 20 minutes, especially with another pair of hands. That being said, once the bed has been leveled, we are ready to print, and there appears to be a mystery model included on the SD card, so why not? We'll let that run, and in the meantime, let's talk about this whole dual extruder business happening up top. So not only can this machine print in two colors, but it can also mix the colors by feeding them both into the hot end at varying speeds to create transitions like the one you see here. Or, if you're not into multicolor printing, there's also the option of loading two spools of the same color with a 50-50 ratio between the extruders, and not running out of filament for quite a while. A while? Yeah, a while. You mean a while? And a while later, it's a... well, it's a dog, but more importantly, check out this detail. Even at a layer height of 0.2 millimeters, which is only half of this printer's full resolution on the Z-axis. It was pretty brave of GTEC to lead with this model, given that FDM printers tend to struggle with smooth curvature and steep overhangs. But I think that what we're seeing here speaks for the print quality better than any commentary I could offer. Anyhow, you're not here to watch me print figurines, so let's get on with the big project. And when I say big... <laughs> Yeah, just wait. As mentioned, it is a bit of a torture test intended specifically for this printer. Acoustically, it is a 6th order series tune bandpass designed around a single 6.5 inch classic subwoofer from Dayton Audio. Links down below if you want to pick one up. I won't bore you with the technical details, suffice it to say the enclosure is meant to cover a range of 30 to 90 Hz at the headrest of this Chevy Sonic hatchback. Size-wise, each half represents the very limits of the printer's build volume, and it'll come together in four parts, starting with the rear chamber. Since the completion of my last project, which, by the way, ran Parts Express out of stock till next year, I've come to appreciate the tongue and groove joint for the simple fact that it works. And there are three of them here, the first of which encircles the opening at the very bottom to form a seal with the terminal plate. This should give us a nice two-tone recess for the binding posts. The second groove runs along this ledge as a structural support for the chamber divider, which also integrates the rear vent. And the third groove lines the outer edge of the lower section to be joined with the upper section forming the front chamber. From there, the pressure vents out into the open, and that's pretty much it. So, on to the actual print. It is made entirely with GTEC brand PLA, 0.2mm layer height, 4 perimeters all the way around, and a 20% rectilinear infill. When I saw how well the printer handled those protruding ears, I decided not to use any supports for the flared parts of the vent as a bit of an overhang test. And it worked, albeit with some stringing which I was able to remove easily enough with a sheet of sandpaper. But I do have to say that getting the print to detach was a bit of a chore. In fact, this would not be an honest review if I didn't mention the effort it took for me to wedge a putty knife beneath the print so that I could eventually pry it loose. Granted, this model does have a footprint nearly the size of the whole build plate, so there's obviously going to be some firm adhesion. 
Speaking of which, here's a little life hack I came up with for when the model overlaps the purge line that prints right at the very beginning. Just lay some thin tape down onto that part of the bed, peel it back right as the nozzle transitions over it, fold, and there it is. 100% of the build volume at your disposal. Which we will need because the next couple of prints cover it pretty much entirely. I made the base of the enclosure 250 by 250 millimeters, which on this machine should have left me with a margin of 2.5 millimeters all the way around the print. And it wasn't until much later that I noticed the right edge of the enclosure ending just shy of where it ought to have, as though it ran out of print volume. But as I've already stated, this is a torture test and we're not turning back, so... And as you can see, the machine works just fine pulling through whichever extruder you specify in the G-code so you don't necessarily have to load two spools of the same thing. Having it set up this way also gave me a chance to perform a filament swap mid-print, which as it turns out is quite simple. Check it out. You probably can't see it here, but under the Tune menu, there is a Change Filament option that pauses the print, raises the hot end, moves it off to one side, retracts the filament, and prompts you to load a new spool. Once you've done that, the nozzle heats right back up, and after some preliminary extrusion, the print resumes. Upon completion, the potty knife is back for round two. And as I go to pry this thing off, just think, you're looking at a model that's 250mm on all three axes, so if you've been trying to visualize just how big a thing you can print on here, there it is, give or take 5mm, and it came out alright. Apart from the clipped edge and a little bit of stringing, there's really nothing wrong with it. So now let's move on to the upper section, which, as you can see here, is also getting clipped along the right edge. It could very well be that the printer's actual build volume is closer to 248mm on the x-axis, or 7mm short of the advertised figure. Thankfully, the internal geometry remains intact, and the print is coming along nicely. Further on, you can even see where I swapped the filament with a slightly different shade of red. And with this being the taller of the two halves, it may also be the one to challenge the printer's limit on the z-axis, which, sure enough, upon completion is exactly 1.5mm short of a complete model. As you can see here, we're missing the tongue that joins with the groove of the lower section. However, as I'll continue to emphasize, this is not a conventional print, rather an opportunity for the machine to mess up in as many different ways as possible, so any glitch that we manage to bring about will be taken in stride. That being said, it's time to put this thing together. I didn't bother filming the terminal plate being made, as we've already established that the printer does an excellent job with any model that doesn't exceed the actual build volume, which at this point I would estimate at 248mm on the x-axis and 250mm on both the y and the z-axis. And it's accurate too, all the tongue and groove joints were given half a millimeter clearance and everything lines up just fine. So, once the epoxy cured around all the bits and pieces for the lower section, we can wire in some binding posts drop in the sub, and figure out some way to get the upper section to adhere. As per usual, my solution is blue tack. It's strong, it's airtight, and it's removable, which gives us an easy way to access the sub if ever there should be a version 2 of this enclosure. Hmm. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll do a demo here shortly, and since I did design it for my little hatchback, let's wire that up as well. And here, all the credit goes to Audio Dynamics for the effort put into this very impromptu install, and for supplying this brand new MK600.1 amplifier which, even at a 4 ohm load, will still deliver the sub's rated power with headroom to spare. And you'll see plenty more of it in my future mobile sound-related videos. Anyway, now that we're all wired up, let's see how the 3D print performs as an actual factual car audio subwoofer. Beginning with the frequency response. That looks almost exactly like the predicted response. Bring it in some so I can do like a side by side. And there it is. Right here. In all honesty, this could not have been more dead on, especially given that I simply dropped the sub in without adjusting anything. So now let's do a brief listening test with the Fairbanks Theorem soundtrack, as it features a very broad range sliding bass covering a bandwidth of around 30 to 300 Hz. And we'll use the mini DSP ears binaural microphone to capture the experience, so grab a set of headphones for this next bit.
are so good. Definitely has this very deliberate sound to it. And finally, for anyone on the exhibitionist end of the Connex scale, here's some footage of how the enclosure fares at a distance. <laughs> so now let's draw this to a close with some final thoughts. Right away, you've seen what the printer can do in terms of build volume, print quality and the benefits of dual extruders. You've also seen how it performs when called upon to complete a 200 hour print with multiple filament swaps and plenty of opportunity for things to fail. What hasn't been discussed is the fact that this whole rig can be had for less than 400 bucks. What's more, GTEC was kind enough to offer my viewers a discount, so before you go clicking on Amazon, please check the video description for the latest product links and discount codes. They will come in handy as you set out on your own week-long adventure printing this monstrosity because I'm also making the STL files available on my Thingiverse account. Again, free of charge. So if you're looking to film your own Guess What's In My Trunk style demo, this enclosure is bound to draw some interest, and you'll obviously need a machine with this much if not more print volume to complete the project. So for anyone getting ready to do some shopping, here's what I'll leave you with. If you're looking for a foolproof, low maintenance solution, something that works right out of the box at a press of a button, this may not be for you. There is some minor assembly, some manual bed leveling, some trial and error getting that first layer just right, and some finishing work to be done on the prints. If, on the other hand, you're open to a more involved experience, knowing full well that given some tinkering and a bit of patience, you will replicate or even improve on my results, then the A20M from GTEC deserves a closer look. You can certainly expect to see more of this machine in my future videos as I load that second extruder up with some water-soluble filament to print supports beneath more complex waveguides, among many other things. And with that, I thank you for watching. Don't forget to rate the video accordingly, subscribe for more projects, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!